Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Today's episode is all about technology and food retail, something that we can all see accelerating with every trip to the grocery store or every time we open the Wall Street Journal and see another news article about this topic. But our guest today leads the Food Marketing Institute, so he has some unique insights into the dynamics that are playing out across the food retail space, and he sheds some interesting light on how retailers are evaluating technology all the way through their supply chains. Enjoy this episode with our guest today, Mark Baum. Mark Baum, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today around the role of technology, specifically in the food retail segment. Uh, and so you're uniquely suited to have this conversation with us and bring some insight. Uh, as we get started, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Thanks, Jeanette, for having me, and it's a pleasure to be with you today to have this conversation. Um, my background, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. I am a uh, recovering candy and tobacco jobber from Brooklyn, New York, who lived to tell the tale. Um, and so I've been in the, the fast-moving consumer goods and retailing and distribution industry for uh, well, well over three decades now. Um, and uh, much of that time spent in consulting, doing a commercial strategy for uh, large cap CPG companies around brand architecture, go to market strategies, uh, a lot of sales and customer and channel development management as well, uh, which has led to a couple of accidental stints in the uh, food industry trade and business association world. Uh, I did a lot of Salesforce conversions back in the day in the 80s and early 90s, and that led to my role as the president and CEO of the old National Food Brokers Association. And uh, as that community consolidated, we merged that business into the Grocery Manufacturers of America back in the early 2000s, uh, where I spent uh, several years and then went back into consulting, um, which is where I was doing what I really love to do, which is building strategies for uh, consumer goods companies and retailers. And uh, back in the, uh, two, around 2012 or so, uh, helped to facilitate the strategic planning process for the Food Marketing Institute. And then uh, about a year later, I did the one thing a good consultant should never do. I actually signed up for the implementation of the plan. <laughs> so I have been uh, at FMI now since uh, late 2013 in the role of uh, Chief Commercial Officer. So we're responsible for really the business of the business. And we handle everything sort of on both the supply and demand side of the equation having to do with food retail, and that, of course, is inextricably linked to their uh, consumer goods trading partners and technology solution providers and other suppliers as well. All right. So uh, that's such an interesting background, and that, you know, that really sets a nice stage for this conversation. So I'm certain that you've seen a lot of change and a lot of trends and a lot of dynamic shift um, throughout your career. What are some of the biggest things that you would say are different now in the retail space from, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago? Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting. That's an interesting time frame to think about, Jeanette. Uh, you know, 15 years ago or so, you started to see probably the first wave of what I call channel migration, which is, um, you know, a lot of the uh, consumers that would traditionally shop to one store for their needs, that one-stop shopping experience, started migrating away from that. And uh, consumers were demonstrating this sort of willingness to cherry pick more formats more frequently. And so that wave of competition from, we'll call them non-traditional channels, it started with like big box and super centers. Uh, and then everybody started sort of getting into the food retailing business, uh, uh, drug stores, convenience chains, and don't forget about the, the rise of food service or away from home spending, which several years ago finally got to that 50 cents on every dollar ratio. So consumers are spending as much eating away from home as they are in home. But in the last few years, the last five years, or even less than that in particular, uh, in my 35 plus years in this business, I've never seen the kind of environment that we're in today. Um, just this unprecedented wave of competition going way beyond the, the, the companies I, I mentioned earlier or the channels I mentioned earlier. Now you've got pure play online providers. You've got um, DIY, home improvement, all of these non-traditional providers, department stores. If you go into a Macy's basement, it's a food court. If you go into a Bed Bath & Beyond, you'll find a 25,000 square foot cutout, uh, which is essentially a grocery store. So 
Um, it's just that, A, the competition is everywhere in a very, very sort of competitive, thin margin business. And secondly, um, consumers are shifting their whole uh, view of food values, their path to purchases different these days. So we're really in this omni-channel environment where you've got to reach consumers wherever they are with whatever they want, however they want it, whenever they want it. So it's both in some respects the most exciting time I can ever remember being in this business and uh, a little bit terrifying as well. Oh, I can imagine, right, because that, it's, uh, it's just adding a whole new level of complexity that the industry hasn't faced before, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I like to think of this as a simple business, right? It's products based, it's consumer facing, and we're very, very good at it. I mean, in the U.S. today, we move, you know, product from farm to fork for about 10 cents on your after tax dollar. That's a pretty question. We're really the envy of the world in that respect. But all of the other issues attendant to getting that product from the ground to consumers' plates have become infinitely more complex. And the way in which you reach consumers, the whole uh, area of marketing and sales and pricing and promotion, uh, not to mention just the overall complexity of the supply chain in, say, an e-commerce environment, you know, we always say that last mile now is the most expensive, have just in enhanced the complexity of our, our industry exponentially. Right. So, okay, so if I'm an executive at a major food retailer and I'm sitting here with my team talking about all of these dynamics you just laid out, this whole new world of complexity, how am I thinking about tackling those problems? What am I looking at as far as options? Well, so <laughs> I like to think of uh, food retailers today have sort of a horizontal list of priorities, right? They, they've got a lot to do and they're all really important. But you have to prioritize within that sort of list as well. Um, and certainly, you know, there are a couple of overarching issues, I think, that are fundamentally changing the realities of today's marketplace. Um, one is the consumer themselves. Uh, we can spend a whole day on the shift in consumer food values, but the way in which consumers determine whom they're going to purchase from, in addition to the, what we call the traditional drivers of the path to purchase, which are price, taste, and convenience, are changing dramatically. So things like health and wellness and well-being, uh, food safety, and not just if I eat this, will I get sick, but what are the long-term implications of feeding this product to my child over a period of time? Uh, environmental and energy issues are more important. Social issues are more important. And all this has to be wrapped in this veneer of transparency. So consumers are, are irrevocably changing uh, the way in which we're doing business today. Um, the second thing I think is uh, technology, enabling technology. If it, it, the, the technology that both enables and impacts the business has accelerated just so significantly in the last few years. If you're not technology enabled today, you're way behind the eight ball and you're at risk. And if I take those two realities of both the shift in consumers and the cost of technology Capital is the other major driver of the business today, both access to and cost of capital. All of these initiatives that retailers are undertaking, whether it's the enabling technology from an infrastructure standpoint, um, or it's being used in a consumer-facing way, or you're investing in your digital or e-commerce platform, or you're investing in your physical uh, brick-and-mortar stores to create new experiences using technology or providing better in-store opportunities um, all that has got to be self-funded and all of that costs. So um, that the economies of scale associated with that investment today are going to be really important as well. Mm -hmm. So an example of that, the, the tech-enabled component that you're talking about from a, from a customer perspective is that, uh, so I live in San Francisco and I walk right past an Amazon Go store. And from a customer experience, it's, it, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, you walk in, you scan your Amazon app on the way in, you pick up what you want and you scan your app on the way out and you don't have to interact with the cashier if you don't want to. Uh, it's just a seamless experience. So I, Obviously, it, you know, Amazon, Amazon has a leg up in this scenario, right? But how, how, are, how are retailers prioritizing, you know, you just spoke about the different places they could be using technology in their business. How are they prioritizing, you know, technology from a, from a customer experience versus infrastructure or versus, you know, from their supply chain? How are they looking at that? Well, they have to, they have to look at it on all of those dimensions, Jeanette. So um, 
even within the Amazon Go experience, and although I live on the East Coast, I have had the Amazon Go experience on the West Coast, um, and it is a frictionless checkout, um, and I think all retailers are looking at ways of easing that, that checkout. So automation at the front end is very important, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, at the same time, it's frictionless for the consumer, but it's not frictionless in terms of how you implement. Um, there's a lot of human uh, capital invested in that high-tech experience at an Amazon Go, right? So if you've been there, you know there's a greeter to help you mm -hmm. the app and get you into the store. There are several folks to help you navigate those purchases. There's a couple of folks in the back room who are preparing all those grab and go items for you. And there's someone on the back end as you're walking out just to make sure everything went well. Um, and, but I do think it's for a, for a busy commuter, it's a great meal occasion experience. And I think uh, you'll see more of that going forward. Um, but I think it's, it's not, it's not a one-stop shop by any means. So I, I think retailers have to think a little bit more expansively about that. Um, and it's not just the checkout experience. It's the assortment that you are providing. It's the way in which you're providing that in-store experience on a more personal basis. And think about that for a second. It's, it's hard for a, a, an industrial era mass production based industry to create personalized and customized experiences. We're trying to move to a market of one and these in-store technologies, these, these, technologies that you can use that you can build into your apps when your consumers are searching online, either on your site or within the store, uh, are allowing you to do that. Because now, using things like artificial intelligence, uh, in-store technology like beacons, you are reaching consumers both when they are just consuming, either the ads or the programs or the plans that you're presenting, as well as when they're shoppers in-store making the decision to buy or not to buy, as it were. So, all of those technologies are helping retailers better understand their consumers and personalizing that experience. So go back to the point I made about health and wellness a little while ago. If you understand the profile of that shopper household, you can provide them with information that lets them know that you're thinking about them and you care about them and you're going to be their partner in helping them make more mindful choices for themselves and their family. So for example, Rather than just send you a coupon, a sense off coupon for a particular item, maybe I send you a newsletter or customized communication that lets you know that we've got five new items that we think that you'd be interested in when you come to the store next time. Here's where you can find them. And oh, by the way, you might think about these three other things. So once mm -hmm. again, consumer now, I've received a message that makes you, that makes me feel like you really understand me and you're really trying to help personalize my shopping experience. And as a retailer, I haven't given away a dime when it comes to profit margin. Uh, so it's a win-win situation in that particular instance. Absolutely. So that, what you just described, this just changing, changing fundamental process around how the retailer interacts with the, with the, with the consumer, it's interesting because, you know, we've recently had an, a conversation with Bill Rupp, the meat industry executive, and he was describing how, you know, the way that meat is merchandised has really not changed that much. And he described this vision of the virtual meat case where retailers were able to interact with consumers in a different way in order to help them find, you know, identify find new cuts that they want, help the retailer identify, you know, which promotions are we going to run in which store, uh, and, and doing it all at a much more granular level because you have access to ad additional data, right? And so, uh, so it's interesting, what you just described is, is, is just the, the, the flip side of exactly what Bill was describing to us as well. So on, on this note, then, I'd like to, to stop for a second and talk about the impact of Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods on just on the broader food retail space. And it, it seems as though it's setting up, you know, that, that everyone sees Amazon has become the behemoth it is because of their ability to, um, to leverage the data they have for decision-making and leverage it through the supply chain, right? And so it seems like now there's this race to compete with those capabilities, not just in terms of how they interact with the consumer, but how they structure their entire supply chain. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, how do, how do you see the impact of Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods playing out right now? Sure. Uh, but Jeanette, before I do that, can I go back to Bill's comment? Cause Please. Uh, so I love Bill's vision for the, the virtual meat case going forward. 
And it's an example of how these technologies are shifting that experience. And you have to think about the traditional, you know, he said we haven't changed meat merchandising in 20 years. He's right. And traditionally, consumers like to see sort of the butcher in the back room through the glass actually, you know, cutting meat back there because it's it, it takes them back to kind of that, you know, that very sort of like what I call that, um, you know, 19th century merchant's philosophy, which is mm -hmm. and you knew exactly what you were getting or you could cut it to a specified thickness or whatever. But there's so much more you can do to enhance that overall experience going to a virtual meat case, but you need to do a couple of things. You need to educate consumers, right? And technology can help you do that. You also need to figure out what you do with those, um, with those uh, folks who, meet, who work in the meat department. Maybe they're better off not behind the glass door. Maybe they're better off in front, out by the case, helping to educate consumers and giving them ideas about meal preparation and what to pair with and the like. So there's a lot that goes into these, um, these decisions, and it's not just the enabling technology in and of itself. While there's a lot of technology that is, I think, being able to drive a lot of those experiences, um, one of the questions we need to determine is what's the interface between humans and machines? What's the interface between humans and robots and automation and machine learning and all of the rest? It's what we kind of call the missing middle, right? It's not that machines are going to take your jobs. They're going to change the way you do your jobs. And as a retailer, how do I repurpose maybe some of the lower value activities at the front end? So maybe now my cashiers, if I can automate that frictionless checkout. Maybe I repurpose them into in-store customer service representatives who are spending more time with the shoppers while they're shopping through those aisles. So there's a lot to be said for all of that as well. But I, I, I love Bill's vision, and I can, and I, I can envision a time when using virtual and augmented reality in the meat department that becomes mm -hmm. that's more commonplace throughout the industry. Um, with regard to, to the Amazon Whole Foods tie-up, I'll, I'll just say this. First of all, you know, there's been a lot of breathless coverage of that in the media in a lot of places. So I like to kind of dispel some myths about it. Um, and one is that the, the world is not shifting to online and mass. It's growing. We've done a lot of work. We've dimensionalized the online marketplace opportunity as one that will grow to about $100 billion by around 2023 or so. Um, that's a big market. Um, and uh, if you were to equivalize that into brick and mortar stores at an average, say, square footage of about 35,000, 40,000 square feet, that's uh, roughly just shy of 4,000 stores. Um, doesn't mean they're all going to go away, but it does mean when the music stops, not everybody's going to have a chair. And it does mean that the physical store itself is going to become somewhat repurposed over time. The Amazon acquisition of Whole Foods was nothing less than an acknowledgement that brick and mortar matters and that there are some experiences that can't be replicated online. And if you think about food and beverage in general, it was a late comer to the party, right? Because um, food is tactile, it's intimate, um, and it's experiential, and tastes differ uh, within communities, even sometimes within households. So, you know, when you buy a book or you buy a stapler, uh, it's the same. Whether you're in Portland, Maine, or you're in Portland, Oregon, it's a somewhat commoditized product. Food is different, and there's no and it's and and it's and it is tactile. So you use all five senses when you're food shopping or when you're eating, and that experience is both intimate and metaphoric at the same time. And when you go into a store and you smell the bread baking, or you sit down for a hot, delicious meal, or whatever it is, that cannot be replicated online. I think Whole Foods understands that. Um, I'm sorry, I think Amazon understands that, which, are, which is why they uh, purchased Whole Foods and, they're gonna, and they'll learn from that just the same way that traditional brick and mortar uh, retailers are learning from their own online experiences. And they're learning very, very quickly. Um, just to put it into perspective, however, food today, um, I said that'll grow to about 20% of the business, 100 billion um, over the next several years. Today, it's on average, 3 to 4% of the business, but again, growing quickly. And what's also interesting about that is it's not just growing in center store, which is obviously the logical place to start, where you have shelf-stable items. You have items that are much more, I think, um, inclined to be uh, bought on a regular cycle. So 
automated fulfillment or subscription services certainly suit those items. But as consumers gain confidence with their retailers that those retailers do understand their preferences and can deliver on a cost-effective and efficient basis, they're quickly moving into more of those fresh categories. Uh, as I audit stores all over the country, when I walk in and I'm looking at those those carts that are being filled by employees or third parties on behalf of those retailers, I'm seeing more, more perishables in those carts all the time. I'm seeing more leafy greens. I'm seeing more fresh meat. I'm seeing more fresh seafood and the like. So certainly we're seeing that shift occur as well. But it does have implications for the supply chain because I said earlier, you know, that last mile can be the most expensive. Um, retailers as well as Amazon are figuring out, you know, how they need to shorten their supply chains and where they can sort of like shorten that point to point within those supply chains so that they can deliver on a cost effective basis uh, all the way out the, the system. And by the way, that's not limited to either retailers or their suppliers, but sometimes their supplier suppliers as well. So technology is, is impacting the value chain from end to end at this point in time. So that is a really interesting uh, direction to take this conversation because, you know, like I said, a lot of our listeners are, you know, come from further upstream in the food and the meat industry. And so as you, as you, you talk to, to retailers and you're seeing how they're shifting those value chains, trying to shorten those value chains, uh, what, what's the specific role that you see technology playing in that? Well, so it, it's playing a, a, a really significant role. Um, First of all, it's, uh, it's being used between retailers and particularly their CPG trading partners to better understand the business requirements, both from a B2B and a B2C standpoint. So it's having a dramatic impact on that model of trading partner collaboration. Um, and you're seeing it all also in the way that products are being uh, picked and selected and delivered from point to point. So think about warehouse automation and robotics and the role it's playing there today. Um, and there's a lot more complexity in that as well. Whether you're picking from dark stores or distribution centers or you're repurposing sections within those stores for that, automation is playing a huge role in your ability to do that efficiently vis-a-vis -vis the balance of the business. Um, and then just moving inventory from point to point. I'm sure you know it's no secret to anyone that there's a transportation capacity challenge in our industry today. Um, automation is going to help not, I think there's a lot of ways in which we're going to address that in terms of being able to uh, uh, get more drivers uh, to handle the, uh, the required loads that are out there, but also technology. You're seeing some companies experiment with, um, uh, with driverless cars or driverless delivery in some cases. It won't be too long before we see that from point to point, and that's going to require new technology, which will be sort of like what I'll call maybe the, the labor arbitrage model where you have the right labor that greets the driverless truck or car or whatever it is when it gets there so that you know what to do with the inventory when it arrives. So um, a lot of this sounds kind of like Star Wars-ish. It's not. <laughs> You're starting to see a lot of experimentation going on with a lot of these technologies right now. Um, you know, the, the commercial... Uh, application, and when I say commercial, I mean large scale so that it becomes somewhat more ubiquitous within the industry is probably a little ways off, but as the technology refines and it becomes uh, more accessible and more affordable, you're going to see more people do it, and I think it's just going to become more of a way of life going forward. Great examples. So, you know, speaking specifically around the value chain at, at at Decision Next, we're we're applying machine learning and prescriptive analytics to helping companies throughout the supply chain uh, forecast prices, forecast supply, forecast demand as they're making those purchasing or sales or pricing decisions. And the thing that we come back to again and again that we see is that successful implementations are the ones where you have the right person interacting with the right technology. And that feels like a theme that I've heard you talk about throughout our conversation is this idea of the human and the machine interacting together in order to get to some specific business outcome. Uh, so it, it, it sounds like that's a thread that you see uh, right now in the landscape as well. Yeah, great point, Jeanette. And, and I'll say this, it's been kind of a subtext of everything I've been talking about, but you're right. The, 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 the way in which you win is you put the right combination of technologies and human skills together to optimize the outcome 
or the solution. And it's an area where we have been spending a lot of time uh, talking to retailers and their trading partners. Uh, number one, there's there's a couple of sort of dual challenges happening right now. One is the challenge of making our industry an attractive career destination. Um, you know, CPG and food retailing are not uh, the destination uh, industries that they once were, say, 25 years ago, right? 25 years ago, if you were a marketing major at a business school and you came out and you landed a job as an assistant brand manager at a large cap CPG company, that was it. Um, now, not so much, right? Um, and uh, they're attracted to, you know, sort of uh, the hotter industries around technology per se, or life sciences, or uh, aerospace, or energy, or some of the, the, the industries that uh, have really been in the spotlight, which is not to say that you cannot have an, a very rich and rewarding and dynamic career in CPG or food retailing, and we're working really hard at that whole sort of industry attractiveness and recruitment and retention of the next generation of workers and leaders. Having said that, the other challenge is twofold. One is how you get the balance between what you invest in technology and you invest in your people right. And at the end of the day, going back to your point, Jeanette, if you don't invest in your people, all the technology in the world will not save you. And if you look at the best companies in our industry today, with the money that they're generating, they are reinvesting back into their people, into their pay, into their education and training to optimize their performance. That's really where uh, good dollars are being spent. At the same time, you have this other challenge, which is uh, automation and robotics will replace some of those, say, traditional functions. Um, so the question is, do you repurpose those functions or those individuals into other areas of the business? Does that require retraining or, re or educating in a particular different way? And also, in order to harness these emerging technologies, you need people with really good sort of like knowledge skills and analytical skills. And those people are more expensive than maybe some of the traditional physical distribution employees or even some of your in-store employees. So where do you go and how do you get the, uh, the requisite capital and know-how to bring those people into your organization? And by definition, many of those people are coming from outside our industry. So while, you know, historically we've been, I like to say we're a great big industry, but we're a really small incestuous community in that, you know, uh, the names and faces don't change very frequently, just the affiliations on the badges of trade shows. You're seeing a whole new generation of folks coming into the industry, particularly in information and technology and data and analytics roles, who are not from our industry. So we need to teach them about, you know, both uh, sort of from the, the, the product side and the cultural side of fast-moving consumer goods and food retailing. So the whole area of the future of work and how that's going to manifest itself in this technology era is one that is front and center for, for the industry today. It's amazing, Mark, how every conversation I have around technology and just these fundamental shifts across the industry, it always ends with a conversation around people, people development, people management, succession planning, and really just that leadership component uh, of, of how these companies are, uh, are, are managing their, their most important asset of their people. So uh, I appreciate you bringing that just full circle there. Um, on that note of, of leadership and company culture, let's wrap up here. Let me ask you this. So what do you see as the characteristics of leadership or culture uh, or company, co company leaders that are, that are getting in front of all of these trends that are going to be the winners? What are the, what are the characteristics that they have from a leadership perspective? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, just to sort of maybe set the table for what, uh, how I might sort of uh, answer that, um, I truly believe that in any company, in any business today, people are your most precious asset. Even in an industry like ours, which is product-based, right? People mm -hmm. are still your most important asset. And all of the technology... Jeanette, that we've been talking about, in some respects, has led to more face-to-face -face requirements than ever before. You just can't do things machine now. There are machine-to-machine -machine technologies. You know, the, we haven't even touched on the Internet of Things or or how smart appliances are now making decisions on behalf of, of consumers and rippling throughout the supply chain. Um, but I think when it comes to leadership, inspired leadership, and our our industry is we're fortunate. We do have a a long history of inspired leadership within the industry. 
And there are some fundamentals about that that have not changed. And that is a um, continuing to stay on top of or get ahead of trends. Uh, change is the only constant in our business, and it is happening at a pace that is exponentially greater than at any time that I can ever remember. We've kind of like taken Moore's Law, and we've sort of blown it to bits. And the, the, the forward-thinking C-suite executive today is, is really trying to look out and ahead as much as possible, not just at the most pressing issues that we face today, but the emerging issues. So if we talk about all those technologies that we've discussed here this morning, and we put them on a piece of paper, we can address each one of those. What I worry about is the ones that aren't on the piece of paper. What's coming? What's next? And what will the implication of that technology be? Um, and I also think inspired leadership uh, embraces the change. It doesn't just wait for it to happen. Inspired leaders embrace and indeed help to shape that change and also can articulate a vision for their, for their enterprises. They have a sense of purpose. Uh, and not just sort of, you know, from a corporate standpoint, from a personal standpoint, they know why they get out of bed in the morning and they can instill that and imbue that within the culture of their organizations. And so it's not just a mission statement or a vision statement. It really goes to the values of that business and how they're employed and that everyone understands what they are and they understand where the company is going and they understand the role that they play in helping the business to get there. I think that those are really fundamental things. And I'll just say one thing in closing about sort of people. At the end of the day, the food retailing business with all of the technology enhancements we've been talking about is still fundamentally a people business. It happens when you walk into a store. Just think about that experience, that, that smile you see in every aisle. Uh, all the, it, the, the sensory experiences that we talked about earlier as you walk through the store, that's where the magic happens. That's where it really comes alive. And, you know, as I like to say, it's at the store where anything is possible. Um, and even as Mary Poppins said, and Mary Poppins returns recently, <laughs> even the impossible. And that is due to people. Well, that is a great note to end on. So, Mark, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and for shedding some insight here. And it's definitely an exciting time to be a food consumer, but you've painted a picture of why it's an exciting time to be uh, in the business and in the in the broader food industry. So, uh, thanks for joining us. Well, Jeanette, thanks so much for having me. It was uh, great talking to you this morning, and uh, uh, I'd like to do it again sometime. Mm -hmm.